Hello, this is Bruce Wallenberg, and this is Lecture 4 in our series on Power Generation, Operation, and Control. We'd like to point out that uh, this lecture is not necessarily about power systems. This is about the mathematics of optimization. And we're going to give you actually several lectures now about uh, optimization topics before we pick up the, uh, the topic of uh, economic operation of power systems. Uh, this one is about continuous and differential differentiable functions. So if we if we start here with a with a uh, a function like this, it's a function of two variables x one and x two. If I set f equal to two, then all the points x one and x two that's that that um, can give you a value of two look like this ellipse here. If I set it equal to one then I get this ellipse here. So these ellipses represent um, the uh, the function f. Uh, this is the you 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 could look at this uh, something like a like a map with uh, uh, contour lines. So this is the contour lines of this uh, of this function. We're going to try to minimize that. Where is x one and x two? that reach a minimum. So we'll take and we'll do the normal thing we do in calculus, differentiate each one with respect uh, to the first variable x1, set it equal to zero, do the same with this, the second variable. If we stack up those two derivatives, we come out with what's called the gradient or del f. This is the, uh, the symbol for del f, the symbol for the gradient, and we want to get it to zero and zero, which means the minimum. Well, it turns out, of course, the derivative here is 0.5x1, so that's 0 at 0, and this one is 2x2 is 0 again at 0. So, so the optimum, very simply, is down here. The minimum is down here. So if you want the minimum of the function itself, it's right here at the origin. Okay, now we're going to make the problem a little bit more complicated. In fact, we're going to put a constraint called omega, and that constraint is a straight line. But you always want to write this as omega equals zero. See, we, what we're saying is 5 minus x1 minus x2 equals zero. And that's this straight line like this. And what we would like to do now is we want to, we want to minimize this function, our objective function while maintaining omega equals zero, which means that we're only allowing the points that are on this straight line uh, that are where I'm, where I'm running the, the cursor up and down here, the pointer up and down. That's those are the only points allowed. Now if if I had a, a large um, a larger ellipse out here or a larger one out here, we would see that, that these points intersect at larger numbers than 5. I mean, we, we might have one for 6, and we might have one for 7, and so forth. And where they intersected would be different, and we'd like to reach the minimum value of f that's along this line. So we're, we're looking for the minimum f along that line. And it's going to occur not surprisingly, where it is tangent to the line. That is where the minimum value will occur. And that happens to be at x1 equals 4 and x2 equals 1. Now if you take the gradient of f, and here I'll draw the gradient of f up here at this value, f equals 6. Notice that it points in this direction like this. It is perpendicular to f at this point. This is the gradient with respect to omega. And it is also perpendicular here, but these two vectors do not line up. They do not line up. Therefore, this point is not an optimum. And if you look at it, you can say, well, if I, if I, if I can go a little bit lower down here, uh, I can get a, a smaller value of f. 
and this vector will start to bend over. If I go way down here, once again, I'm perpendicular to F and I'm perpendicular to omega. They don't line up. At the optimum, those vectors line up. And this is what the French uh, mathematician Lagrange realized was that he could use this property to mathematically solve the problem. And it simply said, I have a gradient function and I have, I have another gradient over here. And these are vectors. And so if I take the gradient with respect to f and the gradient of omega and I just multiply one of them, in this case we'll always multiply the constraint function, if I multiply it by a scalar, so lambda is a is 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 uh, uh, always used in this in this context for uh, for Lagrange, and that's why we use the the Greek L or lambda. It's a scalar. It's just one single number, and all it does is adjust the length. And it says if if I adjust the length of this, I can add it to this and get zero or in effect, I, I'm, I'm really getting, this should be a zero with a, a line under it. It's a vector. In our case, it's, it's this vector. So if I, if I want to get the zero, zero vector, I can adjust just the length of omega. Now that means they have to line up. It just means that uh, whatever the value of omega is, I have to, I have to adjust it a little bit to get, uh, to get it to, uh, to, to cancel out the uh, gradient and, and give us a sum of zero. So. What we do then is we form something here. Again, we use this big script L. This is the, the Lagrange function where we add our objective plus the constraint multiplied by our scalar. Now we've only got one constraint, so we're just using one lambda here, a scalar. Notice now that I have one, two, and I have added a third variable. I don't know the value of, of lambda. So I've got, I've now got a function with an extra variable. So I now have three variables. And so we, we just treat this Lagrangian the same way we would in calculus. We're going to take the derivative with respect to x1 and the derivative with respect to x2 and the derivative with respect to lambda, set them all equal to zero and we'll solve our problem. So we'll do this. We'll put the function in there. There's our objective, there's our constraint, and there's the, there's the lambda right here. And we take the derivatives like this, and so you get a, when you take x1, you get 0.5x1, and here you get minus lambda. Here you get 2x2 minus lambda, and you get, when you take the derivative of lambda, you always get this constraint function back. So here we have what we have three equations, right? Three equations and I'm just going to say three unknowns. Three unknowns and the, the unknowns are x1, x2, and lambda. Now this set of equations can be solved if you want to put them into a to a matrix and um, invert the matrix. If you want to run that, uh, that's that certainly can be done on your calculator or on your computer. Um, a simple way to do it here is to simply say, well, uh, x1 has to equal 2 times lambda, x2 has to equal 1 half times lambda, and so now I say 5 minus 2 lambda minus 1 half lambda, and then I can solve for lambda. So I can do it just by substituting. And then when I've got lambda, I can go back and get these. And remember we said that the solution was at x1 equals 4, x2 equals 1, and now we know the value of lambda. So that's how we solve it. That's how we mathematically solve the problem, uh, in, in this case with one equality constraint. If I have several equality constraints, okay, then uh, I would have to set the problem up like this with lambda 1 times omega 1, lambda 2, omega 2, and so forth. And I have to do the same solution again, except that now I've got two, X, I got two x's, x1 and 2, and I got three lambdas. So I got five variables, five derivatives, and I can solve the problem again. Um, these no, notice that that 
these problem these equations uh, do not have to be linear. They do not have to be linear. Uh, they could be nonlinear. Okay, they could be nonlinear. Um, but then, then when you go to solve it, it gets to be it gets to be even more difficult uh, a, a little bit because uh, you won't have linear equations anymore to to plug into this and st finding the the solutions and there may be multiple solutions. Let's leave that for now. Now the next is to talk about inequality constraints. So we've done one where we had omega equals zero. Well, in this case, I've got a constraint that says g of x1 and 2 is less than or equal. I'm always going to use that n never a greater than constraint. We, you can always convert them over. So less than or equal. And what it means is if, if any points out here are, are considered violating, and we say that's the infeasible region. Infeasible means you don't meet the conditions of the constraint. So I can't have any points out here in this in this range where I've got it cross hatched. I could have points on the line or anyone over here. So everything in here is is okay. So anything in this direction is okay. Those points and that we say that's the feasible region. Now this extends out, you know, on a straight line all the way to uh, to infinity or whatever you want, but uh, we just know that that above the line is infeasible. Below the line is considered feasible or uh, okay. It it does not violate the constraint. So now I have a problem that says minimize this, meet the condition of some of of a number of equality constraints and meet the condition of a number of inequality constraints, where x is just a vector. Well, when we've done this, we end up with something that's a much more complex problem to solve. And the mathematics for this was originally done by, by these people. Um, originally, uh, much of the, the, the world recognized the work of uh, the mathematicians Kuhn and Tucker, but later on discovered that there was another fellow, another uh, mathematician named Karouche, and had done earlier work, so they honored him by calling this uh, uh, what we call the Karouche Kuhn Tucker conditions. Uh, sometimes you will just hear these referred to as KKT. Okay, uh, KKT these conditions and here here's what they are so let's say we develop a Lagrangian again an objective plus a set of Lagrange multipliers lambda times Omega these, these are functions that are all equal to zero and then we have different uh, Lagrange multipliers designated as mu and we have these functions G which are less than or equal to now at the optimum, so we'll, we'll give it this superscript uh, uh, zero over here as the optimum of of this problem meets minimum of the function meets the equality constraints and meets the um, the uh, inequality constraints. So the first thing is that the derivatives with respect with, with respect to the x's are all equal to zero. Are all partial derivatives with respect to the x's are equal to zero. Uh, the derivatives with respect to the lambdas give us back this omega. So every omega that's an equality constraint is equal to zero. I just say that that derivative gives us a restatement of the constraint condition. When I take a derivative with respect to mu though, I get the G condition that that says it's less than or equal to zero. However, the Kuhn Tucker Karush Kuhn Tucker conditions require that we look at a fourth condition called the complementary slackness condition. And what it says is for every mu and and its 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 respective uh, G function, the product of mu and G equals zero, and mu is a is a number, it's a scalar that's either equal to zero or greater than zero. Um, and what this means now is that 
this is the, the complementary slackness condition, and we're just going to look at it. either mu equals zero, that'll give you a zero up here, or g equals zero, that'll meet this condition, or both are zero. Okay, that's very that's that's an unusual condition. It's usually one or the other of these. And obviously if mu equals zero, that means that g is not zero, okay, it's not zero, and it's therefore not binding. You know that when we said g is less than or equal to zero. Well, if g equals zero, that means we're right up against the constraint. If g equals zero, so so let um, let me put that over here. We say we say if g is equal to zero, okay, then we, then we call that binding. That's binding. If g is less than zero, then it's not, I'm just going to say not binding. Okay, I won't write that all the way out. Not binding. So this means binding means it's right up against the constraint. If it's less than zero, well that means it's not binding and the points are as as it as it were they're in the feasible region but they're not up against the constraint. Okay, and we know that when mu is zero, we are not binding. That that means that this this condition up here is met because mu equals zero. If we're to if we're in a constraint uh, uh, where it it and then then of course I'm pardon me if mu equals zero then this then this can be some some number that's that's not binding. If mu uh, if if uh, g is binding if g is is binding then mu can be a number uh, greater than zero. And usually is okay. Then and it usually is. So let's take an, an add another g constraint. Here's our our g says that it's it's another linear function less than or equal to zero. And here's here's g right here. This is our line w over here. And we originally solved and said, well, if you're just minimizing with respect to this uh, objective and you want to meeting that equality constraint, there's the minimum. However, now this one says this this function has to be less than or equal to zero. Well, if you think about it, if these numbers, let's say x1 and x2 are way out at, at, at 5 or 10, then this would be a large number and the whole value over here would not be less than or equal to zero. So this region out here to the right of that line is the infeasible region. Can't have any points out here or they violate this. You can have a point that's on the line or back over here, back out this way, it's okay as far as that, uh, that constraint is concerned. So what we're looking for then is the minimum of the function and it's got to be on the G function or else it's got to be in the feasible region and it's got to be on the omega. And what we do is we, we're going to go ahead and show you the logic using that complementary slackness to solve the problem. Our Lagrangian now has the original objective in x1 and x2. It has lambda times the omega function mu times this. How many variables now? Four variables four variables or four unknowns. Now, here they are. Here's the, the objective. Here's omega. Here's the g function in here. I take derivatives with respect to x1 and x2 and I get this. I get minus lambda plus mu. Here I get minus lambda plus 0.2 mu. So that's uh, in, in these two derivatives. And then I get the second Kuhn-Tucker condition is this this one that's the omega condition and uh, the third gives me 
the g of x function out here. This is my inequality constraint. And the fourth condition says mu times this equals 0. or And mu must be greater than or equal to 0. Now, we know how to test for a solution being optimum, but we don't know exactly how to get there. So what, what I'm saying is we, we can start out and we could say, OK, let's try this. And is that an optimum? Well, we can test it. But we don't know exactly how to get to the optimum. And the, the, the reason is because this mu value, we, we don't have an exact way to, uh, to solve for it here. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, set mu equal to 0, then by conditions 1 and 2. Well, mu equals 0 says that g of x uh, can be any old value. We're back to our old minimum again here, 4, 1, with x lambda equals 2. But at 4, 1, we have a number here, x1, x, uh, pardon me, uh, 4 plus 0.2x2 minus the 4 was the, was the other uh, 2 times x. Was, pardon me, x1, here it is, 0.2 times x2, minus 3, we get 1.2. Well, that's not less than or equal to 0. So this function, this, this solution is no good at mu equals 0. So now I'm going to say, OK, let mu equal um, be greater than 0. And then I can just say, well, OK, if, the, if mu is greater than 0, then I know that both constraints are, uh, are binding. So I can just use those constraints to solve for x1 and x2. I get a different solution. And then I can go back to condition 1, and I can solve for lambda and mu. And it turns out now that g is exactly 0 when we use 2.5 and 2.5. So all the conditions are met. We've, we've solved for uh, all four conditions of the, the gradients with respect to x1 and x2, the derivative uh, with respect to lambda, meaning that the omega function is OK, and so is the g function satisfied down here. So we've satisfied it. So this is the solution uh, to that